church. Morning. Let's stand and worship the Lord this morning. Let's sing to him, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Holy, holy, holy.
flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Amen. Let the King of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from, oh, he is my song. Let the King of my heart be the shadow. been there. 
are so good to each one of us, Father. You are holy and there's no one like you, Father. So we sing a song of surrender to you, Father, this morning. And say, Father, have your way in our lives, Lord. Communion Supper, instituted by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, is a sacrament which proclaims his life, his sufferings, his sacrificial death and resurrection, and the hope of his coming again. Amen? It shows forth the Lord's death until he returns. In the Church of the Nazarene, we have open communion to all those who are truly repentant, forsaking your sins and believing in Christ for salvation, and, in the, and to invited to participate in the death and resurrection of Christ this morning. As the body of Christ, we have the privilege to share in the Lord's Supper together. The Lord's Supper is a means of grace in which Christ is present by the Spirit. It is important for us to remember what Christ has done for us and to receive communion with hearts full of gratitude. Yes, Lord. Let us go to the Lord right now and ask him to cleanse our hearts and minds to help us to surrender before him our lives that we might please him. Just as we sang this morning, have thine own will. In Psalm 139, 23 through 24, 51, and 10 and 19, all say, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. 
See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way of everlasting. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfaithful, un- unfailing love. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin, Lord. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Let's bow our heads and pray. Blessed be the God of our salvation who bears our burdens and forgives our sins. Thank you, Lord. Almighty God, to you, all hearts are open, all desire is known. With you, no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit that we may perfectly love you and worship you. In Jesus' name, all of God's people said, amen. The Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Lord God, we come to you in true humility and faith as we partake of this holy sacrament today. The body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was broken for you, preserve you blameless unto everlasting life. Take and eat this in remembrance that Christ died for you and be thankful. We are thankful, Lord. The blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was shed for you, preserve you blameless to everlasting life. Drink this in remembrance that Christ's blood was shed for you and be thankful. What a privilege it is, Lord God, to be in your house today to worship you, to honor you, to do this in remembrance of you. Thank you for what you've done for each one of us, for your great love and your mercy. Lord, we give you all the praise and all the glory and all of God's people said, amen. Good morning, my name is Lynn Weaver. I am one of the associate pastors here in Las Vegas, Church of the Nazarene. I am an ordained minister, elder in the Nazarene Church, and I am a volunteer, as are two other pastors that serve here. We do not receive um, a salary, but we give our time and our talents and our gifts to the Lord, and it is a privilege to do so. This morning, um, we're going to go into the Word a little bit, and we're going to start out with prayer. Father in heaven, thank you so much for this opportunity to meet together as a congregation, as a community of believers, Father God, that we support, encourage, and love one another as we gather in your name to espouse our love and our devotion and care for you, our appreciation for all that you've done for us. And this morning as we've taken communion and are again reminded of the great sacrifice that Jesus Christ made for each one of us upon the hill of Calvary so that we may um, be forgiven of our sins and to dwell with you eternally. Father, there is no way to uh, measure the benefit, the love, 
um, that is extended to us. Thank you. I ask that your Holy Spirit will be here today to teach us and to guide us in all truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, the truth will set you free. We hear this phrase all the time, coming from all sorts of places. On a talk show, a woman is talking about her cheating boyfriend, and the host says, well, the truth will set you free. Gloria Steinem, you may have heard of her. She's a famous feminist. She published a book. It came out two years ago. The title of her book is, The Truth Will Set You Free, But First It Will Tick You Off, except that's not the word that she used. And the title goes on, Thoughts on Life, Love, and Rebellion. I learned that on the original headquarters of the Central Intelligence Agency, carved in stone, there are these words, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Now, this is the CIA. This is a government entity that is legally allowed to carry out covert action. The National Security Act in 1947, right after the World War II, defined covert action as special activities, both political and military, that give the U.S. government the ability to legally deny anything that they're doing. And they're talking about truth here. Um, they may be necessary, but why would they put that scripture on a building that is an organization that is dedicated to subterfuge? It's mind-boggling. This phrase, the truth shall set you free, is carved into the uh, buildings as a motto in many universities and colleges today. And these are halls of higher learning where Jesus is not welcome. In the movie Liar, Liar by Jim Carrey, you may have seen that movie. There is a, he's an attorney in a divorce trial, questionable situation, and he shouts, and the truth shall set you free, as he makes a point that wins the day. We have politicians that present their version of the truth to further their political or personal agendas. There's a uh, saying, truth and politics have never been on good terms with one another, and that may be a truer statement. Um, and that is, we understand that the use of lies within politics is a justified tool in the dealings with mankind and with, um, with the public. Our media has become more and more untrustworthy in reporting the news to the public, and every day we hear a different story about the pandemic from the CDC, what, how to do this, how to do that. Deliberate falsification or alter, alteration of the facts is considered acceptable, even preferable, by those who have an agenda or if they will benefit from it. In fact, the truth in the world today is becoming a bigger and bigger challenge. Lies have become a part of the fabric of our daily lives. And I haven't even begun to, or nor am I going into, all the concept of false religions and false teachers. This is not just an American problem, it is a worldwide problem. It's not just a modern problem, it has existed in every period of history since the beginning of time. It began in the garden with Adam and Eve. When the enemy of man, the devil, Satan, or Lucifer, he's known by many different names, confronts Adam and Eve. And I'll just read in Genesis chapter 3, 1 to 5. Now the serpent was the most cunning of all the wild animals that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you can't eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat the fruit from the trees of the garden. But about the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden, God said, you must not eat it or touch it or you will die. No, you will not die, the serpent said to the woman. In fact, God knows that when you eat it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, 
knowing good from evil. There are three basic things that happen. First, Satan confuses the issue. And isn't that what happens in all situations where lies or manipulations are used? Is the situation is confused and the lines of truth and error are blurred. And this is one of Satan's tricks. The second thing he does is he refutes God's word. Because God had said, if you eat the tree, you will surely die. He had told Adam that, chapter 2, verse 17. And here Satan is going, no, you will not die. So he's saying that God is lying and has lied to Adam and Eve. And they can't trust God. And then he tells them the reason is because God wants to hold you back because he knows that when you eat that fruit, you're going to become like him. You'll become like God. So lies began in the garden, and we have the fall of mankind. Sin entered into the world. Later, when Jesus was here walking upon the earth and he was talking to the Pharisees, He said this in John chapter 8, verse 44. Now we have to remember the Pharisees were the religious leaders of Israel. And they had a personal agenda. And they were compromising what they believed was true because they were looking and incurring Rome's favor to keep them into position. And he says to the Pharisees in chapter 8, verse 44... Let me find it. You are of your father, the devil, and want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and has not stood in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he tells a lie, he speaks from his own nature because he is a liar and the father of liars. Jesus had also confronted them that they were trying to kill him and murder him, which is what their intent and purpose was and what they finally accomplished, and they denied it. But he says here that you belong to your father, the devil, who was a murderer and a liar from the beginning. And, of course, we know that God does not lie because in him there is no darkness. From the beginning of time, as I said, When Adam and Eve ate of that fruit in rebellion and disobedience to God, sin entered the world. And lying became an interwoven part of the nature of mankind and the society that we live in. And as common as it is, I don't think there's anyone in this room that likes to be lied to. It is a betrayal of trust. It tears apart relationships. It hurts those that are closest to the liar. And lying can become addictive if someone lies and lies and lies and they're not confronted and they're not suffering the consequences. And it can become the consequences of the life of a liar and those that are touched can become immeasurable and, in some cases, irreversible. Divorces um, happen because of lying within the marital relationship. Things or partnerships are torn apart. It just, lying destroys, and it began back in the garden. Could I have the next slide, please? When Jesus was brought before Pilate, the morning of his crucifixion, he said this to him, I have come into the world for this, to testify to the truth. Now, Pilate's response might be typical of ours today. What is truth? asked Pilate. And that's a very good question, and it, has, it goes down through the ages. But it has been suggested by numerous scholars that Pilate's question is not coming from a place of honesty, but coming from a place of cynicism and skepticism. Perhaps he has seen too much scheming in his exposure to Rome and his career as a Roman soldier and then a governor. Because if Pilate were truly seeking truth, he would have found it because it was standing 
right in front of him. In every age, and even today, what's called deliberate falsification of facts is considered acceptable. Um, in fact, the truth, to find the truth in any area or arena of leadership in this world is becoming a bigger and bigger challenge. And it's in every country, among every type of leadership. It's not solely a U.S. problem. So as we are buffeted by the news and pulled this way and pulled that way and one politician is saying this and another one saying a completely opposite thing, who can we believe and where can we go to? We're hearing alternate truths. We're hearing conspiracy theories flying every which way. What is true? Jesus said he came to testify to the truth. Now, what is the definition of truth or something that is true? Something that is true is real and genuine. In other words, it's not fake, false, misleading, twisted, misrepresented, altered, or counterfeit. So Jesus came to tell us that which is real and that which is genuine. And to testify means to bear witness to something or to certify that something is accurate, to confirm or assure something is true. So he says that he has come to certify as accurate what is real and what is genuine. He's testifying to the truth. And if he's testifying to the truth, that means that there is truth out there and it's possible for us to know what that truth is he came to clarify what is true what is important and what is necessary to live our best life here upon this earth and in the world to come truth in in uh, versus lies truth is refreshing it saves us and frees us from error. It fosters trust within people. It protects us. It changes us for the better. And truth gives us clear guidelines on our beliefs and our behaviors. I did an internet search and I asked the question, how do we find the truth? Oh my gosh, I cannot tell you how many conflicting answers popped up and they were as conflicting as the many people that answered it and all of them were wrong that didn't include Jesus Christ and there were a myriad of opinions about how we find truth and what truth is. May I have the third slide please? Is it say? Yes. Jesus told them I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me, John 14, 6. When Jesus says, I am, and we have numerous I am statements from Jesus and from God in the Old Testament. I am the Alpha and Omega. I am the resurrection and the life. I am. That term is used over 300 times in the Bible asserting who and what God is. And here in the Greek, the common Greek, Koine Greek, the term I am is ego emi in the Greek. And what this literally means is I am, I am he, or it is I. And what is, this is an emphatic form of language that Jesus speaks that elevates the common verb. Way is just a word, but when he says I am the way, now that word has become a descriptive title or even a name for himself. And so he, he says, I am he, I am, or it is I. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. He embodies these very traits within his nature because his essence is light and holiness and love. 
There was a German theologian that lived in the 1800s, Wolfgang, good, good German name, guess. And he said, a man can at most show others to the right way, but he cannot be either the way, the truth, or the life. We can show others the way to the way, the truth, and the life, but we cannot be the way, truth, or life to anyone else because Jesus is the way and there is no other. The definition of the word way is a thoroughfare for travel or transportation from place to place, an open passageway. So Jesus is the way. He's a transportation from place to place. What is that? He transports us from this place of lostness and bondage of sin to becoming a place within the kingdom of God as a child and inheritor of the king. He is an open passageway to the Father. The second part of that verse says, uh, no one comes to the Father except through me. We don't come through any other religion, any other prophet, Buddha, Muhammad, Joseph Smith, no other way, only through Jesus Christ. He's the only one that can take us to the Father and to eternal life. Because Jesus is the truth, he tells us the truth. He's genuine, he's real, and he's 100% dependable. His words and promises will not fail and cannot fail. Slide number four, please. So as Jesus was speaking here in chapter 8, and if you read this whole chapter, there's several things that are happening. Jesus is at the temple. He's in Jerusalem for the Feast of Tabernacles, which is in the fall. And the Feast of Tabernacles has ended. So he goes and he spends the night on the Mount of Olives, which he often did, slept out under the stars on the Mount of Olives. And at dawn, he went into the temple, and this to began to teach. He sat down and began to teach. And this is when the Pharisees and scribes bring the woman caught in adultery. And we hear, we know how that story goes. Who condemns you? Um, and he said, let who, he who is without sin be the first to cast a stone. And they eventually trickled away. And he looks up, and the women are gone. He says, where are your condemners where those that have condemned you and she said no one condemns me he says neither do I but go and sin no more he goes on to begin to talk about being the light of the world and he talks about an other things and as he's talking there's an audience there besides the scribes and Pharisees challenging him there are those that we see in verse 30 that as he was saying these things, many believed in him. So Jesus said to those who had believed, If you continue in my word, then you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Jesus said that same day in the same um, situation. He says this, uh, You are from a below. I am from above. You are of this world. I am not of this world. I told you that you would die in your sins if you do not believe that I am he. Ego am I. You will indeed die in your sins. Many began to believe in him. And then he says, if you continue, then this is what will happen. So now we have a conditional statement. Whenever you see if, in the Bible, and I used to always circle in red every time I'd see if. I don't do it. I haven't done it in this Bible. But that shows me that's a conditional statement. And sometimes you'll have if followed by then. Sometimes the word then isn't there, but it's implied. So if gives us the condition uh, that this must happen. The then tells us what is going to be the result. So here Jesus is saying, if you continue in my word, and that word continues means if you continue, if you remain and dwell and persevere and stand steadfast in my words, 
then you are truly my disciple. And what his words, that word logos, it means here, if you will continue in my teachings, in my sayings, in the things that I have spoken, my commands, my exclamations, my parables, if you remain steadfast, if you listen and hear and obey and follow, that's the condition. The result is then you are my disciples. Disciples are followers or students. So it's interesting because what does this mean? Is this evidence of whether we are a disciple or not? Only 18% of Christians in America read their Bibles. That's the word of God. This is the word of God preserved for us for all these many years. So what happens is if we're not in this word, we're not a student of the word. We're not a student and follower of Jesus Christ's sayings. We don't know what it is that he has said to us. It's, here's an interesting question, and I'm not going to answer it, but can we be saved and not be an active disciple? I'm sure Bob would like to have that discussion. Maybe that's one that needs to be spoken at some time. Can we truly be saved and not be an active disciple? Jesus said, if you continue my word, then you are my disciple. And the next part, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. That word know means to perceive and understand and be acquainted with the truth. If we're not reading this book, we can't be acquainted with it. If we don't know what's in here, we're not uh, understanding what it is that God wants us to know. And what it means, the truth again, the reality behind a matter, that which is real and genuine versus counterfeit. And knowing these things will set us free. So Jesus promises that if we spend time in his word, we're going to come to understand what it is we're reading. In fact, I love, um, right after I became a Christian and I was consuming the Bible, I came across this verse, the very end of Luke, chapter 24, and it's after Christ's resurrection. And he is walking with the disciples and explaining how the Old Testament um, prophesied his coming and his death and his resurrection. And it says in verse 45 that he opened their minds to understand the scripture. If we will open this book, God will open our minds. He's not going to give us a book and then not give us the opportunity to understand what it is that it's saying. And it's whether you're a child, an adult, um, Everyone can understand the important parts of this book as we come to know him. Jesus also says that he's truth. We'll know what is true, but we will know the truth, which is himself. And he sets us free from the bondage of sin and death. Therefore, if the Son sets you free, you really will be free. Jesus' words are preserved for us in the Bible, and he spoke both to the Old Testament prophets and to those who wrote the New Testament. To go back here, Moses, uh, we had oral tradition from the time of Adam and Eve, but Moses wrote down the first five books of the Bible called the Pentateuch, about 1300 BC, when they had left Egypt and they were. Um, in the wilderness and probably began on Mount Sinai when he was up there twice for 40 days. And he wrote the first five books and the law out of the inspiration and guidance of God. And then the rest of the books were written and then going into the New Testament over a 1400 year span. So the oldest part of this book is 3300 years old. The newest part of this book is nearly 2,000 years old. And yet it is timeless. It's been preserved. It hasn't been corrupted. 
Jesus said not one jot or, tit, jot or tittle, King James, will pass away from my words till all things are completed. The Bible is timeless. You can read electronic manuals or math or any other type of medical journals. Any other type of man, manuals or journals become outdated as new things are discovered or new techniques are developed. But this Bible is timeless. The principles don't age. They don't become antiquated or out of style. The principles in the Bible live on from generation to generation. Let me read um, Psalm 19, written by King David. And it begins, I won't read the whole thing, I'll just read two or three verses, but it begins by declaring that the heavens declare the glory of God. And it talks about how creation um, establishes who he is. But then in verses 7 to 11, it's talking about the word of God. Verse 7, the instruction of the Lord is perfect, renewing one's life. The testimony of the Lord is trustworthy, making the inexperienced wise. The precepts of the Lord are right, making the heart glad. The command of the Lord is radiant, making the eyes light up. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are reliable and altogether righteous. They are more desirable than gold, than an abundance of pure gold, and sweeter than honey, which comes from the honeycomb. In addition, your servant is warned by them, there is great reward in keeping them. This is the benefit of studying the word of God. It is perfect, so it renews our life. It renews our understanding. It's trustworthy. It makes us wise. It's right, and it makes our hearts glad, and it uh, lights our eyes up. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. And it's reliable and righteous and more desirable than gold. It has great rewards within it. How can we pass this up? And this has been true when David wrote it 3,000 years ago or 2,500 years ago, whenever it was. And it's as true today. And why is that? Because God is unchanging. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. The precepts of God do not become old-fashioned. Modern times do not trump, trump what the Bible says is true. And as the world is spinning out of control around us, as it seems to be, we can find solace and comfort and courage in this ancient yet timeless truths of God. It is not God's design that we be as little children, tossed by the waves and blown around by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning with cleverness in the techniques of deceit. But speaking the truth in love, let us grow into every way into him who is the head, Christ. That's from Ephesians 4. If we are not anchored in this we can even as christians be tossed by every wind and doctrine that blows around every story on the internet every um you know all these uh what's the word uh conspiracy theories even about the vaccinations or what's happening or uh, there's just so much and we can be tossed around and confused by all of this, by human cunning, with cleverness in the techniques of deceit. But speaking the truth in love, let us grow in every way into him who is the head. I'll just tell you this. I got saved um, 36 years ago. I was involved in a cult where I was working very hard to become... 
a, a god. We were taught that we could become a god equal to the god who created this earth, and we could create our own earth um, after we had passed from this life to the next. When Jesus Christ, the true Jesus, exploded into my consciousness, um, I was a single mother with an eight-year-old son. And my life was a mess. I was making really good money. I had a great job. But my life was a mess. And when God, when Jesus Christ introduced himself to me, and I embraced him with every fiber of my being, I knew that I knew that I knew that the path that I had been following was wrong. I didn't know how it was wrong. I didn't know why it was wrong. I didn't know where it went wrong. I just knew it was wrong. And that was because I figured out later, I didn't know at the time because I didn't know anything, that when we become saved, the Holy Spirit takes up residence within us. And part of what the Holy Spirit does is testifies to what is true. And so the Holy Spirit now, which basically came into me like a rocket on fire, um, indicated to me that what I was involved in was a lie. And I, I didn't know how. But I know that I went home that night from a um, Easter service in 1985, and I began to open a Bible, and I began to read it. And it's interesting, because it was a King James, and that's hard to understand. And yet, as I read it, I could understand everything that I was reading. And I was sitting in bed at 3 o'clock in the morning, reading a King James Bible, Sam was sound asleep, and I'm crying, and I'm going, I understand it. I understand it. I didn't know why I understood it, because I didn't understand who the Holy Spirit was or what the Holy Spirit was. I just knew that the effect was I, was, I was understanding this Bible that, not this one, but a King James Bible that I had tried to read prior, and it didn't make any sense to me. It just didn't make any sense. But if I had stopped then and just gone to church and, you know, involved, got, you know, loved the worship, went to church, enjoyed the fellowship, but I hadn't continued to read the Word of God, I would not have grown in my understanding of who God is. And yet I began to pour myself into this. And I'll be honest with you, many parts of it I didn't understand. I didn't understand a lot of the Old Testament. Since then, I have come to understand a great deal because as we study and we're exposed, we have little levels of, of understanding grow. It's like maybe taking the layers off of an of a onion. And the more we know, we can apply it to this area of Scripture like, oh my gosh, that finally makes sense to me. It's a journey of discovery. But if we continue in his word, then we are students of Christ. We will know the truth, and the truth will set us free. I've been invited by a friend of mine that I've known since I got saved in 1985, who's now full-time missionary in Thailand. And he invited me to participate with a group um, to read the Bible in a year. And I talked about that here, uh, the, I think, a little few months ago. But we're using the version Bible app. And he's chosen for us a chronological reading. So we're not doing, like I told you, I did, I'm not good at a little bit of Old Testament, a little bit of New Testament, a little bit of Psalm. It's too fractured for me. But this is a chronological reading. And what I've discovered and I've never used, and maybe some of you have already discovered this, so you're way ahead of me, is that there's a daily reading set up six days a week, but you can click an icon, and it will read it to you. And so I am doing that. I'm, I'm sitting every day, and I read, it's three or four chapters, and I let it read to me. And what I'm enjoying about that is, I'm just sitting and listening and meditating, and then there are things that are popping up 
that I hear that, what, well, wait a minute. I don't think I ever heard that before. And I've been studying the Bible for 36 years. So that's the process. We can always be learning it, things. A new understanding can hinge on the turning of one word. But if we are getting the bulk of the word of God, not just a verse on a morning devotional, but consuming the bulk of this, what happens is that we get a bigger picture of who God is. We hear over and over and over about his love, about his provision, about his care and his interest, and what he's willing to do for us and how he desires to bless us, preserve us, protect us, and provide for us. And it changes our outlook on the world. As the world is falling apart, and we may be moving rapidly towards the end times, it kind of looks that way, instead of being stirred up by fear and saying, well, this vaccination is the mark of the beast, it's not. That's a different thing, and it's going to come about differently. But nevertheless, we can have a peace and a surety and a comfort that God sees us, knows us, is intimate about us, cares about our daily lives, cares about our daily circumstances. Could I have the picture, please, Laura Lynn? Jesus is the truth, and Jesus tells us the truth. He has shown mankind in real and tangible ways who he is, even from the beginning, all through the Old Testament and his dealings with mankind, but especially when he came to earth to dwell among us in human form and he sacrificed everything. He didn't come here to amass a fortune, have a career, have a, you know, a following, except that that following be true believers. He has shown us who he is in real and tangible ways. And I picked this picture because of the hands of Christ and um, what he suffered for us. Now, I'm pretty sure that there are some here today, I'm, it has to be, that have not fully surrendered to Christ. And maybe you've been to church most of your lives but there's something holding you back, and maybe you're skeptical, maybe you're cynical, maybe you've been hurt, or maybe with a lot of you guys, you're just so independent and strong. But Jesus is trustworthy. He's never going to lie to you. He will never take advantage of you. He will not neglect you, and we need to let go and to trust him. To try him, test and see um, how he will bless you. For the rest of us, let's fall in love with him again. And how do we do that? Let's spend time in his word. Let's start picking up our Bibles and reading it daily. Or let the U version read it to us. Let's see what God does in our midst when we are totally sold out to him. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord God, we are so, so grateful for the preservation of your word and that though there have been enemies in every age that have tried to destroy the word of God, to try to destroy it either physically or destroy its reputation, it remains strong because you said that it will stand and it does stand. Father God, I pray for those that for whatever reason may have held themselves back from totally surrendering to you. Lord, that you by your Holy Spirit, that you would reach them and speak to them right now, this very moment, and say, trust me, I'm right here. I've always been here. And I'm waiting for you to open your heart and your mind. And I promise you, I will come into your life. And I will not do you harm, but I will do you good. And I will claim you as my own 
Father God, let us not be afraid of surrendering. Let's not be afraid that somehow we are able to do better for ourselves than God can do for us. And for those of us, Father, that trust you and know you, if we're not in your word in a meaningful way, convict us of that. Give us a hunger and a thirst to draw us into your word because it's here that we come to know who you are. It's here that we see your heart. You reveal yourself. You reveal your plan. And you show us what our stumbling blocks are, what our sins are, and the things that hold us back. Father, we want to be yielded disciples of Christ. We're so grateful, Father God, for our congregation, our church, and our community. Keep us strong, Father God, and make us stronger. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Okay, if you'll stand for the benediction. After the Last Supper, Jesus was instructing his disciples. These are like his last words to them prior to his death. And um, I love this section of scripture. John 14, 1 through 6. Jesus is speaking. Your heart must not be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If not, I would have told you. I am going away to prepare a place for you. And if I go away and prepare a place for you, I will come back and receive you to myself, so that where I am, you may be also. You know the way to where I am going. Lord, Thomas said, we don't know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Hallelujah. Praise God and go with the blessings of God. Shalom. Mm -hmm.